Welcome to Coffee with Charlie, a series by Figma where I sit down with the people behind the design systems at all different types of companies. In each episode, we'll take a look behind the scenes and inside the Figma file of a design system and hear from the designer behind it about the process and any challenges that they've come across along the way in putting the design system in place. In today's episode, I'm chatting with Ashley Seto, who is a lead product designer at Pinterest, and she's the one leading the design system over there. She was brought on in April to start figuring out the business side of Pinterest design system, where previously she was working on the business side of Twitter's design system. So she brings with her a lot of experience. And in this episode, she shared a lot of great thoughts on the governance of a design system, how to handle getting everyone on the team on board with it, deciding what goes in, what stays out and all of that. It was a great chat, so let's get into it. Welcome, Ashley. I'm really excited to have you here today and to learn more about the design system at Pinterest. Let's start by you telling us a little bit about it. Tell us about the design system and why it became a focus for you and the team. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Um, so when thinking about design systems at, at Pinterest, um, our design system is called Gestalt. Uh, it is about four years old. Uh, it's primarily um, been focused on web. And it's also primarily been focused on the consumer side of the business. So if you use Pinterest.com as just a regular user, you're seeing a lot of what is uh, currently in the system. So if you're more of an enterprise user, you know, running ads or maybe even using our internal tools, you don't get a lot of benefits from being able to use Gestalt. We didn't, we don't offer things like tables or charting or more complex components. So um as the business you know grows and as you scale just at the size pinterest is you need to start thinking about other parts of the business and being able to support them so that's been my primary focus uh coming onto the team what's your process been then for putting the system in place you know you came into the business side of pinterest and there wasn't a design system um what's been your process for you know forming that and what are some of the challenges that you've come across in that process? The biggest challenge in coming in, uh, I started in April. So I basically started at the beginning of, of COVID. And a design system is, you know, a horizontal initiative. It covers many, many different teams. And an important part of that is building relationships with those teams in order to work with them and be able to solve the problems that they they might have. So that is very challenging during COVID because none of those casual water cooler conversations happen. Um, and I think the other thing when thinking about, you know, trying to move from just something that you could have considered as a component library to a, a design system is really thinking about the guidance and, and documentation. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big challenge when starting a design system is the cultural aspects. Let's jump in and take a look at the design system as it's set up in Figma. Uh, we have here um, our Figma library. This is our web library, our, our sticker sheet, we call it. Hmm. Um, so the way the way we work is that we use, you know, Figma's um, component, you know, aspects, but we also take um, instances of those components and lay them out in what we call sticker sheets. And this allows us to add some more information to the, the components that might not come along with um, just working within the assets panel. So when you first land on the sticker sheet, you get this version history so you can see what was, what was changed and you scroll down. You can also see component status. So we went through a process of redoing this entire sticker sheet. We've also been recently adding auto layout. So you can kind of check here um, the status of what is completed within the component library. Um, we also offer some, some templates that we're going to be working on in, in the future, but we have kind of set it up on the side here in regards to pages that mirrors our Gestalt Eng mm. documentation. So we have everything ordered the same. So if you were to be working here and you want to jump to the Gestalt Eng documentation, you can um, see the same navigation. So for so example, 
just the little things. <laughs> um, so for example, here we have, we have buttons, a fairly common component that you're going to see in any design system. You get here, you can link out again to the eng documentation as well as our design documentation. We have work that we're planning to do to, to merge these two so there aren't two places people have to go to. But um, it's, it's fairly straightforward. You can come in here and just copy um, the, the asset you need and copy it into your file as well as have a little bit of extra guidance on mm. what something might be like the fact that we separate our buttons by by eight pixels that's just useful information to have in that in that moment as opposed to reading uh the full the full docs let's jump over and see then um like show the people how this navigation lines up with the <laughs> gestalt documents and also i just want to note i love the use of emoji here in in the this navigation as well <laughs> <laughs> you can thank aj for his use of uh, use of emojis so yeah, you can see here it says like data display and feedback. And if we hop over to the Gestalt documentation, you're going to see things like data display, feedback, mm -hmm. and things in in the same order. Um, when you first kind of land on the page, we also very much similar to the Figma file are offering, um, you know, the, the version changes. It's slightly more technical because this is the end documentation. Um, and we have some foundational elements. So uh, we can take a look here at the button as an example. I think that if you're used to looking at design system docs, that this will look um, fairly standard to you. We have um, you know, the name of the component and a short description of what it is. We recently built in this way to expand and collapse Ooh. our props table. Uh, the reason for that is we've learned that engineering, of course, refers to the props as sometimes the most important thing. And for those of you who aren't familiar with props, these are just all the configurations that allow you to change and, you know, make that component look the way it's supposed to. We also have built expand and collapse into the code examples, which allows for you know, easy navigation through the page. So as you're looking at these examples, you'll get information on how to use these uh, components and like best best practices, writing guidelines, things like that. Yeah, and, I love that. Yeah, and if we uh, jump over to the upsell, you can see that um, there's been, as I mentioned, work going on on this particular component, we first built just the text option with the buttons or just a simple message option. We recently added in icon and image, and we also have plans to add in, like I said, a way for form inputs, um, a more customized area down below. So if that's your particular use case, you'll have the flexibility there. Um, if anyone you know wants to view our Gestalt docs, you just have to go to GitHub search for Gestalt and you'll be able to find it. Cool, I'm sure we'll have a lot of people checking that out. This is a lot of stuff, a lot of you know new things being added to the system. Like you said, it's growing and changing all the time. What is the process like at Pinterest for getting a new component added? Tell me a little bit about the governance of it all. Say you wanna get a component into the design system. Mm -hmm. um, you would first start with going to a component crit. We also have office hours as well for smaller smaller questions, but at component crit, that's an opportunity for you to bring forth your particular use case, the things you've been exploring. It's during that time that like other people who you know just work around the company are welcome to join um, other designers and they can see it and they can also give feedback as well if this component might work for their use case. And usually a designer will go through multiple rounds of component crit in order to land on something that solves for the majority of the use cases. And this is, um, and they'll work with, you know, engineering to get that into the system. Uh, and this is kind of where you start to see the balance and the governance and the quality bar in the system play out. Mm -hmm. And I've always, thought of this as this kind of 80, 80, 20 rule of what kind of gets into the design system and what exists within product that doesn't exist within the design system. 
So meaning that 80% of the product is in the design system, but there's always going to be that 20% that is a little bit more custom. Right, exactly. And I think a lot of teams struggle with what that balance should be. Mm. Some, so 80% of your product should be using the design system. And the 20% is reserved for you know, unique things to a particular product, a particular surface that has an interaction that is required uh, for that product to work, but isn't useful to other teams. Or it could just be experiments, things that are being done within the UI that might make their way back into the design system. I always say the 20% is not an invitation for an entire product to not be <laughs> using any of the design system, but it's just that kind of balance between those two worlds. Yeah, and I like knowing that some of that 20% playing around could end up part of the 80 in the future if it works out well. And yeah. I guess that's one of the ways that you can help your design system to evolve is allowing the space to experiment like that um, mm -hmm. to, to possibly improve things in the future. I think that seems like a good rule to have in place. Yeah. <laughs> cool, so what advice do you have then for other people putting a design system in place and maybe tackling this idea of like trying to govern the system and trying to set up a design system for what is already such an established product. Um, any words of wisdom? <laughs> I mean, I, I think that anyone who's deciding to work on a design system, you are, you are going to be challenged in ways that you haven't been challenged before. Um, the amount of communication that you have to do is going to be a lot, and that's actually going to be most of your focus is around communication and process, so really nailing down what those channels are for people to talk with you, what channels are you going to be talking to them about updates, changes, what you're trying to do as a team. Another thing um, is just, you know, the fact that this is, this is a process and it's going to take, take time and a lot of that's going to have to do with your your company culture. I loved hearing about Ashley's 80-20 rule. I think it's interesting to put a number to that and I feel like that 80-20 leaves enough room for some flexibility and to customize things a little for different sections of the app but still have mostly everything fitting within the system. If you enjoyed this episode please give it a thumbs up and like Ashley said if you want to check out the design system for yourself you can do so over on GitHub. All right thanks for watching everyone I'll see you next time. <laughs>